travelers, this is the Baseball Time Machine. Our sports-rich history is full of great stories, ones that are passed down for generations. Tall tale or otherwise, Major League Baseball has seen two teams fight demons of their past. The Curse of the Bambino and the Curse of the Billy Goat played the Boston Red Sox and Chicago Cubs respectively for decades. Despite all of their talent over those many years, it turns out that there was only one man who could save the two iconic franchises. That man was Theo Epstein. How did he do it? Let's step into the portal and find out. Our story begins in 2002, when the Boston Red Sox promoted 28-year-old Theo Epstein to general manager, making him the youngest GM in MLB history at the time. Epstein, raised near Fenway Park in suburban Brookline, was now in charge of one of baseball's oldest franchises. He inherited a talented team, but a cursed one. The Boston Red Sox were once one of MLB's most successful ball clubs. They won five of the first 15 World Series titles, including the very first modern fall classic in 1903. Young two-way phenom Babe Ruth was a key part of World Series victories in 1915, 1916, and 1918. In 1920, Sox owner Harry Friesen, needing cash to fund his Broadway musical, decided to sell Ruth to the then lackluster New York Yankees for a mere $125,000. The scripts flipped from there. The Bronx Bombers, now led by the Babe, won their first four World Series titles and would go on to win 27 over the next century, the most by a single team in North American sports. The curse became not only a focal point in their rivalry, but something acknowledged every time the Sox came close to reaching the ultimate goal, winning a championship. There have been several cursed instances involving the Red Sox documented over the years. Let's briefly go down the timeline. 1946, Boston's first World Series appearance since selling the Sultan of Swat. Ted Williams, in his only fall classic, was ineffective at the plate as he battled an injury. Despite being up 3-2 in the series, the Sox would drop games 6 and 7, falling to the Cardinals. 1948, the Red Sox finished the season tied for first place in the American League with Cleveland. In MLB's first one-game playoff, Boston would lose the pennant. The Tribe went on to win the World Series. One year later, 1949, the Red Sox needed to win just one of the last two games of the season, but lost both to the Yankees. 49 would be the year the Bronx Bombers began their run of a record five consecutive World Series titles. 1967, Boston won the American League pennant on the last weekend of the season after finishing second to last the year before. In the Fall Classic, they matched up with St. Louis once again. After going down 3-1 in the series, they stormed back to force a Game 7, but couldn't take down Bob Gibson in the finale. 1972, Boston finished the season with a three-game set against Detroit. They lost two of three, finishing half a game behind the Tigers for the AL pennant. Had Commissioner Bowie Kuhn rescheduled the games lost to the players' strike at the beginning of the season, there's a chance that the Red Sox could have claimed the American League flag. The Red Sox appeared in the World Series once again in 1975. Despite Carlton Fisk's heroics in Game 6, they couldn't finish the job in Game 7, blowing a 3-0 lead in the game and allowing Joe Morgan to poke a go-ahead single in the ninth. Boston continued to get closer and closer to breaking the curse, but it would live on. 1978 the Red Sox blew a 14-game lead in the AL East to the Yankees, but were able to tie it up and force a one-game playoff. In the playoff, Bucky Bleepin Dent entered his name in the rivalry lore with a go-ahead three-run blast to the monster seats. The Yankees would go on to win the game and the World Series. 1986, the Red Sox were one strike away from winning the World Series and shattering the curse that had haunted them for decades. However, the Mets came back from two runs down, capped off by a Mookie Wilson ground ball that went through first baseman Bill Buckner's legs, scoring Ray Knight from second base to win the ball game and force a game seven. Similar to the finale in 1975, the Red Sox took an early 3-0 lead in the seventh game, only to lose on a late game rally. Collapses in the last two games prompted New York Times columnist George Vexy to write articles describing the Red Sox as cursed. This is when the cursed narrative really began to form. The losses in game six and seven of the 86 Fall Classic started a then record 13 game postseason losing streak. The Sox suffered sweeps in 1988, 1990, and 1995. The streak was broken in 98, but still resulted in an ALDS exit. Boston was taken down by the Evil Empire in the 1999 ALCS. Their next CS appearance came in 2003, which is where Theo Epstein got to experience the curse firsthand. The Red Sox took the Yankees to Game 7 of the ALCS. Once again, the Sox were a game away from the Fall Classic, and once again standing in their way were their bitter rivals. Of 5-2 in the 8th inning, manager Grady Little, and a move that would ultimately get him fired, decided to stick with ace Pedro Martinez rather than going to the bullpen. Martinez, who had suffered a loss in Game 3 and was already at 100 pitches entering the 8th, totally collapsed. New York rallied, tying the game on a single and three doubles. 16 pitches and three crucial runs allowed later, Little came back out and removed Pedro. The bullpen was able to limit the damage and force the game to extras. In the 11th inning, 
Aaron Boone led off the bottom half with a walk-off solo shot, sending the Yankees to yet another World Series. This would be the peak of the Bambino's curse. Taking over a 93-win team might not sound like a tough task, but after coming up short on so many occasions, it was clear that things weren't working for the Red Sox. Epstein decided to build upon their foundation by adding a few hidden gems. He signed David Ortiz, who would become one of the game's great sluggers. He purchased Kevin Millar from the Marlins and picked up Bronson Arroyo, two guys who would play an important role in reversing the curse. Ortiz and Millar had career years in 03, adding to Boston's already explosive offense. The 2003 season was a step forward, on paper. They won 95 games, their most since 1986. Epstein's goal was to get them into the postseason, which he did for the first time since the turn of the century. Although they fell to Boone and the Bombers, they were on the right track under Theo's guidance. He didn't believe in curses, but Epstein knew that some tough decisions would have to be made to break the team's 86-year dry spell. Their first big move of the 2003 offseason was trading for veteran pitcher Kurt Schilling. Schilling notoriously shut the Yankees down in the 2001 World Series. Boston was hoping he'd bring that same energy to Beantown. Terry Francona replaced Grady Little as manager, reuniting with Schilling, who spent time with him in Philly. The Sox followed that up by signing closer Keith Falk, who was coming off a season where he recorded an AL best 43 saves for the Oakland A's. A few new bats were brought in as well, those being infielder Mark Bellhorn and outfielder Gabe Kapler. Both would appear in over 130 games in 2004. Those would be the most notable moves to come from the offseason, arguably the most shocking transaction was made at the trade deadline. In a four-team deal, the Red Sox sent fan favorite and longtime shortstop Nomar Garcia Parra to the Chicago Cubs, while acquiring Doug Mankiewicz and Orlando Cabrera from the Twins and Expos. The trade raised many question marks initially, but 2004 was a contract year for Nomar and just the beginning of his injury troubles. In hindsight, Theo Epstein dealt him at the perfect time. He was lucky enough to get a return that would make them a better team, acquiring two former Gold Glove Award winners in Mankiewicz and Cabrera. The Boston Red Sox continued to improve in year two of the Epstein regime, winning 98 games, their most in a season since 1978. Theo's moves paid off and made them a better team, but still weren't enough to dethrone the dreaded Yankees in the division race. The Bronx Bombers won their seventh consecutive AL East title, finishing three games ahead of the Sox. Both teams took care of business in the ALDS, and would meet up in the ALCS for the second year in a row. It was the perfect opportunity for Boston to get revenge for the year prior, and prove that they were a better team than their far more accomplished foes. However, it looked like the long-running narrative would continue. The Yankees jumped out to a 3-0 series lead, including a 19-8 drubbing in Game 3. With New York one win away from their seventh pennant in nine seasons, Boston would have to do something never done before in MLB's vast history. Theo's acquisitions would lead what many consider to be the greatest series comeback in sports history. In Game 4, David Ortiz clubbed a walk-off two-run blast in the 12th inning to keep the Red Sox alive. He would be the hero in Game 5 as well, landing a walk-off single in the 14th inning to send the series back to New York. Big Poppy had almost single-handedly given Boston hope, but what lie ahead remained unprecedented. Game 6 is what many remember as the bloody sock game. 37-year-old Kurt Schilling, with his team's season on the line, pitched with a torn tendon in his right ankle. Blood poured from a sutured ankle before he even tossed a pitch in the first inning, but it didn't matter. Schilling shoved, allowing only one run on four hits in seven innings of masterful ball. Mark Bellhorn was the difference maker on offense, smashing a three-run homer as part of a four-run fourth en route to a 4-2 victory. The Red Sox had come all the way back and forced to Game 7. Sometimes to challenge history, you have to make your own, and that's exactly what they did. Boston stunned the Bronx 9 in the 7th and deciding game, comfortably winning 10-3 to advance their first fall classic since that fateful 86 series. The 2004 Red Sox became the first team in MLB history to come back from being down 3 games to none to win a series. The baseball world reacted in shock and awe of what had occurred. Fittingly, as the script was about to flip for the Sox, they met the St. Louis Cardinals in the World Series, a franchise that had defeated them in two of their previous four Fall Classic appearances. It couldn't have ended more perfectly. Epstein's guys, Falk and Mankiewicz, recorded the final out. The Boston Red Sox had slayed the beast, reversed the curse, and won the World Series for the first time since 1918. At age 30, Theo Epstein had taken the Sox to the promised land, just two years into his tenure as general manager. He made it clear that this moment stretched far beyond the men on that field. It was a victory for Red Sox of past and present, those who graced the diamond or otherwise. An original goal of Theo's upon his promotion to general manager in November 2002 was to turn the Red Sox into a quote, scouting and player development machine. In a way, he achieved that goal. Epstein drafted several key players that would brighten Boston's future. In the 2003 draft, it was Jonathan Papelbon, selected in the fourth round. In 04, it was second round pick Dustin Pedroia. 2005 brought Jacoby Ellsbury and Clay Buckholz, who would both become All-Stars and World Series champions with the Red Sox. 
Theo Epstein inked a new deal after the 2005 season to remain in Beantown, and would continue to provide a winning atmosphere. Although the Sox would regress in 2006, winning only 86 games and missing the playoffs, they'd return with a vengeance in 2007. Epstein retooled in the offseason, adding the likes of Julio Lugo and J.D. Drew. He also seeked out talent abroad, bringing over 12-year NPB veteran Hideki Okajima, and most notably, former Sawamura Award winner Daisuke Matsuzaka. All four gentlemen would make the Red Sox a better ball club, one way or another. His draft pick shined as well, with Dustin Pedroia taking home AL Rookie of the Year and Jonathan Papelbon pitching to a sub-2 ERA while recording 37 saves. Jacoby Ellsbury hit well at the back end of the year and made a name for himself in the postseason. Clay Buchholz tossed a no-hitter in only his second career start. They finished 96-66, and good enough to win the AL East and break the Yankees' run of nine consecutive division titles. They cruised past the Angels in the ALDS, largely behind a monster series from David Ortiz. After going down 3-1 in the championship series, the Sox won the next three, all in very convincing fashion, defeating Cleveland in seven games to advance their second fall classic under Theo Epstein. The Red Sox met a streaky Rockies team in the midst of their hottest run, known to many as Rocktober. Boston put that to an end immediately, beating the breaks off Colorado with a 13-1 Game 1 win. That was the clear momentum shift, as the Sox won the next three to sweep the Rockies and become World Series champions for the second time in four years. Mike Lowell, acquired with that season's ALCS MVP Josh Beckett almost two years prior, took home World Series MVP. It was incredible how well each of Epstein's big moves worked out. The 2007 victory was incomparable to 2004's curse-breaking triumph, but both ended in ultimate success. Epstein was proud of the hard work shown by the organization, but remained focused on what their foundation, laid by Theo himself, could do in the coming years. The Epstein administration remained successful over the next four seasons, but failed to get past the ALCS. As relations began to sour between players in the front office, Theo Epstein realized it was time for a new challenge. For a team on the north side of Chicago, there was no bigger challenge than winning a World Series. Epstein signed a five-year deal with the Cubbies to become their president of baseball operations, and brought Jed Hoyer with him to serve as GM. The move presented another opportunity to reverse a curse. In his introductory press conference with the team, he insisted that he still didn't believe in curses, but like the Red Sox, history told a different story. The Chicago Cubs also experienced early success in the modern era. They appeared in four of the first eight World Series, winning back-to-back -back titles in 1907 and 1908. They wouldn't win another for over 100 years, but the curse had yet to be put in place. In Game 4 of the 1945 Fall Classic, Billy Goat Tavern owner William Cianis brought his pet goat Murphy to the game. The goat, as you'd expect of a farm animal at a ball game, was bothering fans, and the two were asked to leave Wrigley Field. Fuming following his ejection, Sianis allegedly declared, Them Cubs, they ain't gonna win no more. A statement many chalked up to imply that the Cubs would never win another pennant, at least for as long as Sianis was around. Up 2-1 in the series at that moment, Chicago would fall to the Detroit Tigers in seven games. Sianis passed away in 1970, but the curse would live on. Although the nature of Sianis' curse is unclear, and the accounts of what he said differ, several cursed instances have stemmed from the incident, haunting the franchise for decades. 1969, the Cubs were engaged in a tight division race with the Mets. In a September game at Shea Stadium, a stray black cat walked past team captain Ron Santo in the Cubs' dugout. A universal sign of bad luck, the Cubs would lose not only that game, but the division, missing the playoffs entirely. 1984, the Cubs made the playoffs for the first time since the curse, and took on the Padres in the NLCS. Up 2-0, one win away from claiming the NL pennant, things began to slip away from the Cubs. They dropped games 3 and 4 as the Padres nodded up the series. In the seventh inning of the decisive fifth game, Leon Durham pulled a Buckner two years before Bill, who was traded from the Cubs to the Red Sox earlier in the season, could get the chance, letting a ball go through his legs at first base. San Diego went on to score four runs in the inning, winning the game and the series. 1989, Chicago won 93 games, winning the NL East to face the Giants in the NLCS. With the series tied 1-1 and heading back to San Francisco, the Cubs would blow leads in games 3, 4, and 5, missing out on the pennant. Bullpen blunders and poor managerial moves played a hand in their collapse. 1998. Led by NL MVP Sammy Sosa, the Cubs are in the wildcard spot after winning a one-game playoff over the Giants. Their time in the postseason would be short, though, as they were abruptly swept by the Atlanta Braves, outscored 15-4 in the series. Chicago's true Buckner moment, one so infamous not only in franchise history but baseball history, came in 2003 and can be simply referred to as Bartman. 2003 was the Cubs' best season in a while. They won their division for the first time since 1989 and fought past Atlanta in the NLDS. Five outs away from winning the pennant, everything fell apart for Chicago. 
The Cubs were up 3-0, but the Marlins began to rally. Juan Pierre doubled to put a runner in scoring position. Luis Castillo was the next batter and hit a fly ball down the left field line. Heading towards the stand, several fans reached for the ball as Cubs left fielder Moises Salou leaped to try and grab it. One of the fans, a man by the name of Steve Bartman, made contact with the ball, deflecting it and keeping Alou from having any chance of making the catch. Had Alou made the play, it would have been the second out, putting the Cubs a mere four outs away from their first World Series appearance since 1945. But instead, Castillo drew a walk, bringing the tying run to the plate. An RBI single from Pudge Rodriguez cut the deficit to two. Rookie Miguel Cabrera grounded a tailor-made double play ball to Alex Gonzalez at shortstop, but he booted it. Everyone was safe and the bases were now loaded for Derek Lee, who lined a two-run double into the gap to not the game at three. Mark Pryor was replaced, and it quickly turned into an eight-run inning for the Marlins, creating a margin that would hold. The following night, the Cubs would lose 9-6, to six, once again finishing short of the NL flag. The Cubs were NL Central Division champs in 2007 and 2008, but were swept in the NLDS both years. To that point, Chicago had never won a postseason game on the road against a West Coast team. And like the Boone moment in 2003, Epstein would get to experience Chicago's curse firsthand in 2015. The Cubs made their way through the wildcard game in NLDS, matching up with the New York Mets in the championship series. Their batting average dropped nearly 100 points from the DS to the CS, and they were swept by New York. Ironically, the Mets' top hitter in series MVP was none other than Daniel Murphy. What was that Billy Goat's name? This would be the peak of the Billy Goat's curse. Theo Epstein had quality experience reversing a curse, but working his magic on the Cubs would be an uphill battle. He didn't inherit a 93-win team this time around, but rather a 71-win ball club that was about to get even worse. Epstein called for a total teardown, a rebuild for the first time in years. 2012 and 2013 resulted in 95-plus lost seasons. That's exactly how Theo drew it up. While he was working on resurrecting a successful Cubs team, the Red Sox celebrated another World Series victory in 2013 in large part to the core that Epstein helped build. The bad years resulted in top picks, one being Chris Bryant. Epstein and Hoyer kept busy on the trade block, acquiring several players who would make an impact in the near future. They traded Andrew Kashner to San Diego for Anthony Rizzo, someone Epstein originally drafted when he was in Boston. They also ditched Ryan Dempster and got younger, receiving Kyle Hendricks from Texas. Like a few years back in Boston, Theo worked the international market, signing Jorge Soler. 2013 was all about building up the pitching staff, while getting young, fresh players on the field. The Cubs acquired Jake Arrieta and Pedro Strope from Baltimore. Arrieta specifically was shining in Chicago, playing his best ball. Matt Garza and Alfonso Soriano were sent elsewhere, lowering the team's average age while adding a couple of relief pitchers in Carl Edwards Jr. and Justin Graham. Fans began to grow frustrated after two poor seasons, but Theo assured fans that it was all part of the process, and he was right. The following campaign, things began to move in the right direction. They won 73 games in year three. They used the fourth overall pick on Kyle Schwarber and traded away veteran pitchers Jason Hamill and Jeff Samarja at the deadline, bringing in Addison Russell. At that point, Epstein and Hoyer agreed that they were ready to start acting like the big market organization they were. They fired Rick Renteria after one season and hired Joe Madden, who was available after opting out of his contract with the Rays. The Cubs signed John Lester, reuniting Theo and Jed with the former Red Sox ace. They worked a few trades, acquiring new starting bats in Miguel Montero and Dexter Fowler. Chicago improved vastly with a squad that was finally appearing in their intended image. They won 97 games, earning the second NL wildcard spot and clinching Epstein's first trip to the postseason on the north side. Jake Arrieta, traded for two years prior, was a highlight of the Cubs' season, going 22-6 with a minuscule 177 ERA and even a no-hitter to earn himself the NL Cy Young Award. Although they would run into the brick wall that was Murphy and the Mets, 2015 was a very promising year and a sign of things to come. It all came together in 2016, Theo Epstein's fifth year at the ball club. Like he did prior to the 04 season, Epstein added key talent, including veterans John Lackey and Ben Zobrist. With Zobrist arriving and Addison Russell coming into his own, former all-star infielder Stana Castro was traded to the Yankees. Less than a week into the season, the Cubs would claim first place in the NL Central and hold that spot for the remainder of the year. Over 20 games above 500 at the trade deadline, Chicago kept their foot on the gas. They acquired pitcher Mike Montgomery, who wasn't the biggest name, but would play a major role in reversing the curves. They also traded for Yankees closer Aroldis Chapman. The flamethrowing lefty would be nothing short of fantastic in his time on the north side. The Cubs went on to win an MLB best 103 games, their most since 1910, securing the NL Central in the process. In the NLDS, the Cubs meet the San Francisco Giants, a team only two years removed from a World Series title. Each game was a tight-knit contest, but the Northsiders came out on top, taking the series three games to one to advance to the championship series. 
They'd match up with the Los Angeles Dodgers, who were coming off three straight postseason appearances in which they were left empty-handed. LA jumped out to a 2-1 lead in the series, but the Cubs showed resilience, winning the next three games by a combined score of 23-6 to claim their first pennant since the curse. Kyle Hendricks, who tossed seven-plus shutout innings in the pennant-clinching Game 6 victory, understood that the job wasn't finished. What lie ahead was something unprecedented for decades of Cubs players and fans, the Fall Classic. Theo, when you took this job, what did you think of? Did you think this was possible? Yeah. I mean, what, what prevents us from winning? And now all we got to do is win four or more, so. In the first World Series appearance since 1945, they take on the Cleveland Indians, a team going through the second longest title drought in baseball, trailing only the Cubs. The Tribe hadn't won a championship since 1948, and were 0-3 on the grandest stage since. In Chicago and Cleveland's vast histories, it was their first time facing each other in the postseason. Managing the Indians was Terry Francona, the same man Theo Epstein hired as manager of the Red Sox in 2004 to help break the curse of the Bambino. This time, he'd be in the opposing dugout. Both teams played not only against each other, but against history. Someone had to win and end their drought. At first glance, it looked like it would be Cleveland. They went up 3-1 in the series, shutting out their Midwest counterparts twice in that span. With their backs against the wall, the Cubs turned to their ace, John Lester. Despite going down in the second, Chicago rallied with a three-run fourth, giving them a lead they'd hold on to with strong efforts from Lester in the bullpen, forcing a game six. Still one loss from ultimate defeat, they stormed into Cleveland and took care of business, nodding up the series with a 9-3 victory. The offense was fueled by Bryant, Russell, and Rizzo, all guys drafted or acquired by the Epstein administration. Game seven would be a ball game of epic proportions and widely regarded as one of the greatest World Series games ever played. Corey Kluber got the start for the try, and on short rest, was looking to dominate the North Siders for a third time. He'd had a postseason for the ages, with an ERA below one entering the winner-take-all contest. Kyle Hendricks took the mound for the Cubs. He had a strong 2016, leading MLB with a 2-1-3 ERA. He'd been solid in the postseason, but was on a short leash, with Lester and Lackey both available in the bullpen if necessary. It didn't take long for Chicago to get on the board. Dexter Fowler, the first batter of the game, took Kluber deep to give the Cubbies a 1-0 advantage. The lead wouldn't last too long, as Carlos Santana evened the score with an RBI single in the bottom of the third. The boys in blue answered back immediately, scoring two in the fourth on an Addison Russell sack fly and Wilson Contreras RBI double. The tack on two more in the fifth with a Javi Baez solo shot and RBI single from Anthony Rizzo. Now up 5-1, they had insurance to work with, or so they thought. The Tribe would chip away, scoring two on a wild pitch and an error in the fifth. Even after David Ross extended the lead to 6-3 with a homer in the sixth, Cleveland wouldn't quit. With two outs in the eighth, Cubs closer Roldis Chapman was tasked with recording a four-out save to secure the victory, but the Indians jumped on the fiery southpaw. Brandon Geyer worked the count full before stinging a double into the gap, scoring Jose Ramirez to cut the lead to two. The next batter, Rajay Davis, was known more for his speed than anything else, but managed to cement his place in World Series history with a game-tying two-run homer to left, sending progressive field into a frenzy. Each half of the ninth inning went scoreless, forcing Game 7 to extra innings. The story was writing itself at this point. Whoever was going to win was going to do it in cinematic fashion. As rain began to pour down at the start of the 10th inning, the grounds crew rolled out the tarp, putting the game in what would be a 17-minute delay. Huddled together in the visiting weight room, outfielder Jason Hayward rallied his teammates together with a speech that would be talked about for decades to come. Cleveland comes back on us three runs, our players during that rain delay. Thank you, thank you, Ernie, thank you, Ronnie, for that rain. I was just walking down in the clubhouse and I saw all our players, gathered, all 25 guys, gathered, huddled together, shoulder to shoulder in the weight room. And instead of lamenting what had happened and blowing the lead, they were picking each other up. We got you. We got this. Let's keep grinding. We're the best team in baseball. We're going to win this game. We're going to win it for each other. We're going to win it for the fans. Let's go do this right now. As soon as I, I, I overheard that, I stopped for a minute and I said, we're going to win this game. The tarp was removed and the two teams resumed their winner-take-all affair. Kyle Schwarber started off the inning with a single, putting the lead run on base. After a Chris Bryant flyout moved pinch runner Albert Almora Jr. to second base and Anthony Rizzo was intentionally walked, Ben Zobris seized the lead for Chicago with an opposite field double, scoring Almora Jr. and making it a 7-6 ball game. Two batters later, Miguel Montero added another with an RBI single. Up 8-6 moving into the final frame, the Cubs went to Carl Edwards Jr. for the save. He retired the first two batters, but just like in the eighth inning, the Tribe began to come alive. Brandon Geyer walked and advanced on defensive indifference. At the plate representing the tying run was none other than Rajay Davis, whose eighth inning heroics forced extras. 
This time, he didn't get all of it, but got enough to drive in Geyer and make it a one-run game. Joe Madden brought in Mike Montgomery to record the final out and end the Billy Goat's curse. Brought on as a defensive replacement for Coco Crisp in the ninth, Michael Martinez would be the only thing keeping the Cubs from history. Things couldn't have ended more perfectly. Epstein's guys, Bryant and Rizzo, recorded the final out. The Chicago Cubs slayed the beast, reversed the curse, winning the World Series for the first time since 1908. They rallied back from a 3-1 deficit to win it all, something not done on the road since Pittsburgh came back against Baltimore in 1979. The curse of the Billy Goat was finally over. Theo Epstein had taken another troubled franchise to the promised land. The longest title drought in North American sports history was no longer. The 2016 Chicago Cubs were a special team. They won 103 games in a World Series with a core of young position players. That legendary Game 7, arguably the greatest night in franchise history, contained eight players under the age of 28, a record at the time. The men to thank for building such a youthful and dominant squad? Theo Epstein and Jed Hoyer. Following the championship victory in 2016, Epstein was being referred to as one of the game's greatest executives ever, and was still only in his early 40s. For his contributions to the Cubs, Theo was awarded Sporting News Executive of the Year. Officials estimated that over 5 million people attended the Cubs World Series Parade in Chicago, making it the largest human gathering in United States history, and one of the largest in human history at the time. The team's impact was felt far beyond the diamond. The Cubbies returned to the postseason the following two seasons, but were unable to win another title. Changes began to be made as the team grew further from that magical 2016 season. Joe Madden left in 2019, replaced by David Ross, a member of that 16 squad. As Chicago earned another NL Central title in 2020, Epstein expressed interest in moving on after the next season, believing Bill Walsh's theory that any organization needed a new leader after a decade under the same command. His exit came one year early as he resigned on November 17th, handing the keys to his right-hand man, Jed Hoyer. It was the end of an era, not only in Chicago, but in baseball. Theo Epstein was no longer an executive, and the game would miss his presence. But Theo was always looking for a new challenge, and found one that encompassed all of Major League Baseball. A mere two months following his resignation as Cubs president of baseball operations, Theo Epstein joined the league as a consultant regarding on-field matters. His new role would be determining how new rule changes would affect the game. Commissioner Rob Manfred had high praise for the three-time World Series champion, and was confident that he could make the game better league-wide. Epstein and his colleagues developed and beta tested the fresh ideas you see on the field today. Pitch clock, pickoff limits, bigger bases, and altering defensive shifts were all brought to the diamond in an attempt to compress game times and create greater opportunities for players to display their athleticism. 2023 was the first season that these changes were displayed in the highest level, and the results were positive. Game times were shortened by almost 30 minutes. More fans made their way to the ballpark. Bigger bases and pickoff limits led to more aggressiveness on the base pads, causing a vast increase in stolen bases. The future of the game is in good hands with Theo Epstein and company leading the charge. When thinking about Theo Epstein's legacy as a baseball executive and now consultant, there's no question that Cooperstown should come to mind. Not only did he reverse baseball's two most infamous curses and turn around two of the game's most iconic franchises, but he did it all at such a young age. Epstein was ahead of his time in terms of scouting and saber metrics, spawning a new wave of youth hiring in front offices throughout baseball. Few, if any, were better at judging talent. He's one of only four executives to win a World Series championship in each league. One day, he'll be enshrined alongside the likes of Ed Barrow, Branch Rickey, and our great founder, Albert Spaulding. There's no one quite like baseball's Ghostbuster, Theo Epstein. This has been the Baseball Time Machine. Thanks for traveling with us. We here at Baseball Time Machine appreciate you spending time with us. To celebrate our recent journey, crack these codes for a chance to win a mystery artifact. Safe travels!